This is Basket Case Clubs, CPR Group's podcast where we turn basket case clubs into showcase clubs. Hello everyone and welcome back to Basket Case Clubs. I'm Michael Connolly and I shall be your host on this journey of talking about how things sometimes go well and how things sometimes don't go so well. Joining me as usual is my brother and basket Casey goodness curator, Steve Connolly. G'day, Steve. How you doing? <laughs> Hello. You, joining me as usual. It's It's been a while between drinks again. I must say that we, we get on the wagon and... Hang on, hang on, hang on. Be very careful. You've just said drinks and wagon in the same <laughs> sentence. Like, hi, everyone. Subliminal <laughs> marketing. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I am wrong meeting, wrong very meeting. pleased to be. <laughs> I always get those two mixed up. Yeah. It's just you. You make me want to drink. What can I say? <laughs> oh, I've missed you. I've missed oh. our rambling chats about basket Casey clubs and i'm really looking forward to talking about what is on the list for today uh, and and coming discussions which i'll let you fill everyone in on um because it's really underpinned by this point that we always come back to which is the difference between not-for-profit and no profit yeah i've got so as you know my youngest ethan is now 14 but when he was a lot younger than he is oh oh, that makes you old yeah (laughs) Careful, <laughs> careful. Um, when he was a lot younger, he walked in as I was previewing one of the um, a series of videos that we were doing, um, which are wonderful little videos about all things how to run better clubs. And the one about financial management starts with a <laughs> starts with a bit about the definition of not for profit. Yep, and he still gives me shit about it. <laughs> he still says, "Daddy, remember, not for profit is very different from no profit." <laughs> <laughs> he puts on his big high school drama voice. Oh man, it's funny. It's it's good. it's good value. Hey, we ought to get him involved in some voiceovers or podcasts. Well, he could. Yeah. Well, yeah. you your your older son uh, produced our music. <laughs> daughter does our editing. So it seems Why like not? the next logical step that we throw your young <laughs> child into the mix as well. No, Steve, he's very busy. He needs to go and continue to practice his tennis so that he can become world number one and finally repay. And you can retire. Money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. You can see why tennis is a bit of an elite sport when you just have to stay working late into the evening to cover your tennis lesson fees. <laughs> Uh, anyway, we've probably got some listeners by this point in the podcast saying, what are they going to talk about? What are they going to talk about? Okay, we know not-for-profit is very different from no, from no not-for-profit is very, oh, even I can't do it. Ethan, help. But now we're going to talk about marketing. So we're going to do a few episodes on the topic of marketing, but break it down a little bit. Because it's something that having worked on this and only as recently as last night, running a session on marketing, not just for clubs. Though, that was more of a community organization marketing session. But when we talk about sport, Marketing, I think, is really overlooked. And it's because what's fascinating about about that not-for-profit definition is that a lot of clubs think, oh, well, because we're not-for-profit, it means we can't make a profit. So we're not allowed to run like a business. So we're not allowed to market like everybody else in, who is in business. So we've got to break that down. And also, the, the, what's really important to remember, and this is the difference between sport and other not-for-profit groups, is that sport is part of the very fabric of Australian culture. So where other not-for-profit groups are probably going, so if you've got community service organisations, that particularly the ones that are running services to deal with some charities in particular, and areas that are, where they're dealing with a high level of disadvantage. So for disability support groups, for instance, for mental health support organisations, for domestic violence support organisations, for disease support organisations, There's nothing cool about that. So it's hard when you're marketing, you've got to be very careful about your messaging because if you're separating, let's, let's look at the leukemia foundation's shave for a cure campaign. The marketing around that is around something that is a fundraiser. So then they've packaged up the fundraiser almost like a separate operation. It raises money. So the leukemia foundation can go and do the good that it does providing support, providing research, but it's, it's created something cool so it's you've had to they've had to be very careful in the messaging around that because we can't say hey leukemia is great because leukemia is not great but raising money for leukemia is and leukemia research and support for for the families of, of people with leukemia and people who've died from leukemia so that's great but with sport 
it's not like sport's the first thing to go in Australia. When if if times get tight for mum and dad who pay for junior sport, sport isn't the first thing to go. So it's actually okay to have a focus on marketing to say we've we've got something that's cool, we've got something that's for sale, we've got something that we think you'll like. And as we go through this series and look at the different areas of operation where clubs should be doing good marketing, always keep in mind that sport is cool. We have something for sale that people are buying. So we have a captive market and it's the sort of thing that people hang on to as they go. So while we're going to come back to marketing to attract new members, probably next time, I actually want to start somewhere a little left field. And that's to start with one of the business units that I think is a lovely standalone business unit. So it's not for every club, clubs that don't have canteens, but canteens is where I'd like to start because I think it's an often overlooked business unit of clubs and one that can have its own marketing. Now, I reckon that the most marketing that most clubs and associations that have canteens do for their canteen is unlocking one side of the roller shutter, unlocking the other side of the roller shutter, and rolling up the roller shutter, and then standing oh, come there on. and wait. the lollies on the bench. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes it's just a matter of pushing them forward, isn't it? <laughs> so, so what is it that clubs are doing to market their canteens? And this is a, and I, I ran this ran this as a little exercise in last night's workshop and it was fascinating that everyone kind of goes oh I, I never I never thought about marketing this is off the back okay it's off the back of running a session on marketing last night but it's also off the back of looking at lots and lots of sports clubs financial statements and one of the most recent ones that I went through and I always like to go through a series of, of four or five years of financial statements when trying to paint yeah. a picture of the financial standing of a club. Don't just look at a snapshot in time of one year's financials because often things like grants will throw curly ones into the mix when you, you get a seesaw of profit and loss with money coming in and money going out. It shouldn't be a cannon. It should be on the balance sheet anyway, but, it would, but that's beside the point. The other thing is that things like COVID threw curveballs, And so obviously there was a, reduction in trade through when we had a reduction in seasons but when you have a look at it some it's not uncommon to see canteens actually running at a loss when you just do a tiny little bit of extra maths and say well let's take all of this income and, and, and often management committees not only treasurers but management committees are looking at that income in isolation from their costs of goods sold if they're not if they're not accounted for as an independent business unit and then what comes over is trading profit or gross profit from the canteen operations into the PL, if you've got income and expenditure separated and the, the one i found last last week ran at the, they made a massive amount of money you know all of fourteen thousand dollars <laughs> but they had seventeen thousand dollars of costs oh it God. wasn't hard to add up cost but, of food cost of drink i so, think the, the reason I'm confident, I'm going to go one step further than saying I think, I'm confident that one of the fundamental shortcomings in the way that people in not-for-profit clubs that have a canteen think about their canteen is that uh, even sometimes, I'm sure, subconscious feeling that we can't make too much money, we can't make a profit. Our canteen is here as a a service that we're providing to the people who are here receiving our core business, which is our sporting activity. But I think that it's really important. And what we often, what I often do, and I'm confident that you probably do something similar is encourage people to think more broadly about what they could do, what good they could do, what good their organization could do if they simply had more money. And if what we're talking about here is, uh, you know, in this, um, initial discussion about marketing is, is taking some business unit in your organization, which actually could be really lucrative. Canteens can make a lot of money. Interestingly, here in Queensland, unlike in some other states, it's commonplace also for us to sell booze at, sport, at, at community sporting activities. You can make a shitload of money on booze. Not that you should be selling a whole heap to any individual person, but you can make the markup on booze is great. So therein lies a great opportunity for you to run, you know, to, to, to complement your delivery of core business by running a, a good successful canteen and bar. If you operate in a space where you can 
legally sell alcohol during the and and, uh, and appropriately obviously it's not appropriate to be selling booze at a at eight o'clock on a saturday morning junior, junior sport. sport exactly and, that, and that's great that a lot of state and national sporting bodies are saying while yep. there's junior sport going on this is a, an alcohol free zone and yes i support making a shit ton of money but yep. i also support that so let's do it appropriately so there's a very different in, it, it, there's an important difference in separating junior sport and senior sport when it uh, but even those yeah. who, ca- who don't and can't run a bar can still run events so they can still run a trivia night where alcohol yep. is for sale. So don't see alcohol sales or bar sales as a potential for income and just say, Nope, it's not for us. Yeah. If it can be, but to be done in a, in a way that is appropriate for your culture, but also can be separated from your activities as part of a special event. And unfortunately I think that it's, it's an easy cop out to say, but it's too hard to sell booze. Sure. If, if, if you're making the decision for the right reasons, as you're saying, then then don't sell booze. But, you know, if it creates another opportunity to generate income and it fits within the, the character and, and you know, <laughs> legal framework of, of your operations in your club, then at least consider it. But, yep. but <laughs> it sounds like a mad big... <laughs> <laughs> this has been a really oh, alcohol focused <laughs> discussion on my part. <laughs> oh, That's Tuesday, way, Steve. Driving me to drink. It, yeah, it's clearly. Tuesday. It's been a long, long week already, clearly. Uh, so, and just so that everybody knows, this is not one of those episodes we're doing at nine o'clock. We're drinking a glass of red. It's the sun's two in the up. afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, unfortunately, though, uh, you know, it's, it's often a really significant missed opportunity that oh, yeah. uh, running a canteen profitably and marketing it you know well and and, you know talking through uh some of the opportunities as i'm sure you will will hopefully bring to light the the opportunity that exists for a lot of organizations and 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 the other thing you know just as a little bit of a side point um that really frustrates me is when you see organizations get into really um unfavorable agreements with um you know a, a third party operating their canteen that that favors the the third party but not the organization again because it's the easy route it's it's easy to just oh, let's just hive that off we'll outsource that someone else can run it great if if there's a, a sound arrangement in place that benefits both parties but unfortunately it's often seen again i think as a bit of cop out for um uh, for organizations to just hive that off and not have to do anything about it yeah okay so there's a couple of really interesting points and I'm going to start with the, the back end of what you just said, which is that third, those mm-hmm. third party options. <laughs> so there are the, some of the third party options might be things like outsourcing completely. So yep. we outsource to you and you pay us a lease fee and that lease fee is capped and then you make all of the profit. Yep. That's fine. If that is because then that's also divesting some of the volunteer constraints. Of course, if the arrangement is, yeah, sound and, and beneficial for both parties, then great. If that lease fee is set at the right yep. level, then great. So it comes also from having an understanding of why we're doing what we're doing. Are we running this can? And this goes back to the other thing that I wanted to talk about, which was this, uh, mm. running a canteen as a service in support of what we do. Because for sports like cricket and croquet were the first two that popped to mind, they don't necessarily have a great opportunity to make a shit ton of money because you've got low a low volume of people at the center when you're running your sport. Good point. So that, that means that running a, really, it's more like a, sa- a little sandwich bar with, with a, a few drinks for sale where you don't expect to make a heap of money. Then it's a bit of work to have that operating, but it means that people don't have to disappear to go and get a sandwich and a, and a can of diet Coke to co- to come back and enjoy what they're doing. So maybe in that case, it is seen more as a, um, a complimentary, complimentary, not yep. free, uh, complimentary service to what it is that the people are there to do in the first place. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so you, th- so the discussion that we're going to have about marketing to make money doesn't count for those sorts of organizations, but now to jump back to the third party option, often that's put into place because of the constraint. And so for those of you out there listening saying, yeah, but Michael, it's all bullshit. Cause we don't have the volunteers to run a canteen, and we then have to charge a levy to put people in the canteen and then people don't show up. This is the way to deal. This is a way that you can deal with that to come up with a system that means we're no longer relying on volunteers. Yep. We've actually got a, a, it's a business unit that is run as the business that it should be. And that might involve having a third party operator in. So that third party operation could be something as simple as a lease, or it could go the other way where they make a capped amount of money and we make the profit, or it could be a profit share arrangement. Now, a profit share arrangement can be something that is really simple, and it could be as simple as 
whatever profit we make, you keep half, we keep half. Now that is really simple. And it seems on the surface like it could be fair to both parties. The thing is, if you set up a profit share arrangement, 50, 50, 60, 40, 70, 30, 30, 70, 40, 60, whatever it is that you set up, don't get greedy. This is true for committees as it is for the operators. When you, when you agree at the start, work out, understand what the future can look like and have all of the discussions then when you're setting what the split would be. And then don't get greedy because I've seen awful things happen both in canteen operations as well as in even general management of some clubs where incoming committee members look at what they're paying to a canteen operator or to a general manager and say, oh, this is bullshit. We're paying them 140 grand a year. We could keep all that ourselves if we just take on the workers' volunteers. We can do that. I'm no dummy. I've run my own business for ages. Let's get in and do it. And then guess what happens? Turns to custard. <laughs> yep. And not the sort of custard you want to buy at a canteen, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, so let's get into some marketing then about canteens, uh, what marketing can happen for canteens. Obviously, look, I'll start somewhere that's interesting rather than just, we'll come back to what they can, what clubs should be promoting for their canteens. I'm going to start to on the day. So now an example, and where I first started talking about this was on a Saturday morning. It was a Saturday morning about this time of year. Today's actually the winter solstice. That's one of the, it's, it is the shortest days and could be one of the coolest days of the year for us. And it was standing there at eight o'clock on a Saturday morning. The breeze was up, the clouds were overhead and I was cold and uncomfortable, but sport was going on. It was a net, at a netball association. And this is not a massive netball association. They got eight, 16 courts, And during the course of that day, probably 1,500 to 2,000 people would have been through those, been through that centre. So it starts with the very little players in the morning and or through to the the bigger players in the evening. So we're getting towards the other end of the spectrum from the croquet and cricket. Exactly the opposite end. People come through. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly the opposite end. And I just stood there and I thought I was there for a a boring meeting, like to talk about a constitution or a strategic plan or something. (gasps) How dare you say that? Yeah, I know. I thought that'd be a nice (laughs) (laughs) Who says you need a rod and a reel to go? Line and sinker. (laughs) (laughs) And standing there thinking, oh my goodness. Like now I'm not very entrepreneurial, but I stood there just looking around saying, Mm -hmm. what? And I turned around and looked at the canteen and no one was there apart from the grumpy team members whose job it was to be in the canteen at that time on roster and the canteen con- convener who was a volunteer as well and a disgruntled grumpy cold volunteer i might say on that cold saturday morning St- nobody was there nobody was buying anything yet there were at that time hundreds of people now hundreds of people that include the little people playing netball most of them little girls very little so these are you, you have a young daughter at the moment now is she cute steve I mean, I know that you're biased. Yeah, yeah I'm cute? a little biased. Of course, I'm going to say. Of course, she's cute. cute. She of might course. be listening in one in some future year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, she's cute. Yes, Victoria, you are cute. <laughs> so when cute kids play netball, it is interesting to watch. Now, it's interesting to watch for mum and for dad, which means that the brothers and sisters have been dragged along as well. But yep. it's also interesting for grandma and grandpa and the other grandma and grandpa so we had people literally across the full age spectrum standing around those netball courts. Now, it was maybe from canteen to closest netball court, I'm going to say 15 metres. Mm-hmm. So let's add half of that. Let's say 30, 35, 40 metres from the canteen to where everyone, the closest place where there was a big group of people standing around. I, I'm just going, like, why don't you just go and ask, why don't you send somebody from the canteen there over to that group there and say, hey, anyone want to buy anything? Because if if they had just gone there and said, we have a coffee machine in there that makes really nice coffees and hot chocolates. Can I interest you in, in one? With these people standing there shivering in their beanie scarves and mittens, what do you think they're going to say? Now, they're not going to think, oh, I'll go and get a hot drink. But if somebody says, hey, I can bring a hot drink to you, and even if it's a, that we're charging a premium, they would make a sale. Then we get into seasonal sales. So we go into the evening that night and okay, the, you might be running a bar when you've got senior uh, activities and events going on. But more importantly, at that time, at, at that time of year, what about hot soup? What about hot pasta to, to be able to, and then not only, Hey, come up to me and buy it, but organize a way to have roving, roving sales. Now, of course there are apps and, and 
online systems, uh, point of sale systems that have the ability to have multiple points of sale. So we can actually walk around with a credit card reader and a phone and collect orders and send them back to the canteen. And then somebody can trail around behind us, or you can just collect money and have a, a little ticketing system. So you can do it manually. If you, if you're smaller and not prepared to make an investment in some system to get this going and watch how much more money you make straight away. So yeah, it was just fascinating to watch that this wasn't happening. Now, why doesn't it happen, Steve? Why do you reckon that this sort of thing doesn't happen? Well, I think firstly, it's easy to do the same thing that the people before you did. So if you are taking on a, a and, and I'm talking really there about the, the people who are coordinating canteen activities, so the canteen convener or some similar role, the same applies, and I'm sure we've spoken about it in previous episodes, to treasurers, secretaries, and so on, where if I take on a role, I'm you know, often just the last person to take a step back when helpers <laughs> are asked to step forward. Yep. So I probably don't have a whole heap of time to throw at the role. So the easiest thing for me to do is exactly the same thing that the people before me did. Yep. So just continue the pattern, continue yeah, the pattern. Don't think that's all the bouncing box. ball. Don't mm. challenge the status quo. And, and uh, But really, I'm going to probably bore you with this i think it, it comes back to the the um fundamental flaw in the mindset of you know not even thinking about the canteen as, as an opportunity to generate income to support our service delivery and therefore to go one step further back to not think about marketing it as such yep so but i agree and and you know in the real world when you see most of our fast food outlets now offering drive-through service. If you go, um, you know, to some events, you will have people walking around selling, taking the product to the customer. The, the drinks cart on a golf course. The drinks cart on a golf course. Oh, gosh, I love it, that. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, I think it might be time for you to knock off. <laughs> That's too many. <laughs> and that, that, that was genuine. Oh my God. Yes. Give me a drink. Well, it's because I really <laughs> suck at golf. I really <laughs> suck at golf. So, you know, I'm not there it's to not the drinking the makes it makes you better. It's just that it makes it hurt less. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It makes it less embarrassing. No, but it, you're exactly right. It is. You're not going to walk from, you know, the, the fourth hole all the way over the other side of the golf course back to the clubhouse to buy a drink. So, Clubs, golf clubs recognize that and make it easy for you to buy their alcohol and give them money. And by a sausage the roll. Yeah. Oh, and a sausage Triangle roll. Triangle sandwich. Well. Packet of chips. Yep. Yeah. But the funny thing is now to, to just go back to the, on the sideline at the netball courts, guess what happens at the end of the game? So they, oh, that was wonderful. It's so much fun. They all, because it's quicker to the car park than it is to the canteen. Yep. And you they, this place wasn't set up to just like a theme park, exit Capture through the everyone. gift shop, yep. exit through the gift shop. Just boom straight into the car and guess where they go? Maccas, Subway, straight away. Beefies. Yep. yep. Wherever it is that the player yep. of the match prize, you know, comes from to be given to to the, the winner and all the families go there. So, so somebody's so, getting the money. Somebody's yeah. getting the money. All, I'm not saying to make to, to change what people are gonna do anyway. Hey, just what why don't why don't why don't clubs and th I mean, this happens sometimes for the other team to capitalize on them as a, a market that you've got for a, a period of time. But why don't clubs give away vouchers for their own canteen <laughs> that are contingent <laughs> upon the purchase of something else? <laughs> yeah, but or, or not. Or because not. You, because you're still taking the family to the canteen in the same yeah, way. The six, the when the six year old who has won player of the match, oh, by the way, everybody wins a player of the match gets that little voucher do you think they're going to be the only one who's allowed to have something from the canteen and especially when we get to the canteen and it's not one of those that says oh i'm sorry we don't take card have you got cash <laughs> or if you just head out to the and, uh, this is seriously there's a service station just go out the driveway turn left there's a 7-eleven service station there you can just go they've got an atm so if you go down there and grab your money and then come back <laughs> you've lost I, them they're I not coming pissed back. myself do you know what sort of donuts you can buy at 7-eleven these days steve yeah. what ones that you can buy with a card <laughs> yeah okay yes you can buy them with a card but they're crispy cream so yeah are you going to go to 7-eleven smell a crispy cream donut and a dollar <laughs> coffee get and money a out of hot dog and a big bite hot dog and a slurpee and you can even get sugar low sugar slurpees now 
which you need when you're eating Krispy Kreme donuts, of course. <laughs> Get money out of an ATM, get back in your car, go down to the lights, do an illegal U-turn, come all the way back, go all the way back to the roundabout up at the up to the right, then do a roundabout, and then back in, and then spend money on some stale vanilla slice at the canteen. I don't think so. Uh, uh-uh, sugar. I don't think Not so. Not going to happen. And you know what? How I can tell that they didn't? Because, like I said at the beginning, I got four or five years of financial statements, and I could see that nothing changed. Yep. Nothing changed. Until they started accepting credit card, by the way. Oh, Michael, no. Everybody knows that when they come here, they bring cash. <laughs> and I'm seeing... Everybody? I'm seeing, yeah, yeah. Sorry, well, what but, year is it, Steve? What, and even if they do bring cash, they bring a limited amount. Why limit the amount of money that you can be given by a customer mm. by not Just offering because, a car payment? Yeah. And Let it's people give you money how they want to give you money, not how you think it's easiest for you. And okay, oh, but we right. have to pay a fee. There's some merchant costs. Uh huh. So At making 95 percent of something is still better than 100 percent of nothing. Oh, and realistically, the some of the offerings out there now are so competitive, and and uh, you know, designed in a way that when it, when your little reader or readers sit in a drawer during the off season, they don't cost you anything. Yeah. It, it is, it has become a very competitive market and there is simply no excuse. Now I was going to pick on you earlier for saying, you know, <laughs> even if you're small and you just want to take a ticketing, you know, manage a ticketing system and just take cash. Don't do that. <laughs> no, 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 don't take, don't take cash. Still have your phone and, and your little okay, to, good. To, All right. the phones to tap. But, but if you it, don't want to go into the, the point of sale system. Fair enough. Even though a lot of these uh, square, for instance, uh, has a point of sale system built in. Yeah. So no excuse to not offer it. And again, make your life easier. Why count uh, cash? Why go to the bank? Yep. Let the... It's a no-brainer. System. Plus, by the way, when you use even the little free square point of sale system, you, you just tap, okay, they've bought three coffees and a hot chocolate. It, it's done the maths for you. Plus, you know how many hot chocolates and coffees you're selling every day. So yep. when you're preparing, because in canteens, particularly school tuck shops, you don't make your money when you sell. You make money when you buy, buying the right amount of the right things. And if yep. you're just still guessing based on what worked best last year and without doing things like changing your menu seasonally, so having more hot soup available and hot chocolate available in winter, but in summer, it's the freezies. Now, the, oh, the, the freezer, I don't know if you remember, a lot of clubs in, uh, up in North, uh, North, North Queensland, North Australia, that just <laughs> shove some lemonade just a cheap bottle of lemonade they just pour it into the little white plastic cups and stick a pad of up stick in it and stick them into the freezer and then they just had shelf after shelf after shelf of these things whether it was lemonade or cordial i don't know it doesn't matter because they're paying you know what statistically they're gonna costing sell. them zero cents a cup and they were the most popular item at some of these clubs selling for it's only selling for 50 cents a cup but the the mums and dads, as well as the kids, going back and back and back and back. So they had a one of the big rectangular chest freezers, just full from top to bottom. With <laughs> that's a club that understands its market. Good on yeah, them. and and where they are in the right time of year. But they saw yeah. and then promote them. Yeah, which then leads me back to where I said that we should go, which is how to advertise this stuff as well. If you've got something that is super good, so now, yes, absolutely, promote your menu on social media and do it through the week so that when people, as, and you mentioned the away team coming as, as a captive audience, promote to them as well. Say, hey, guys, look what you're going to enjoy when you get here. And, and don't hide it. Don't hide the canteen, the wonderfulness of your canteen, thinking, oh, no, they're just here to play sport. Let's just, let's not distract them. Bullshit, distract them distract them and by the way they want to be distracted because you know as a parent part of the fun of going to particularly on carnival days part of the fun is what happens every time it's time to eat yeah the morning tea oh they do scones here and they've got oh, and the, the <laughs> green that i get to put on the top of them and the <laughs> cappuccinos are really nice i know that it's only a pod machine but they gee they they do a good job and they and it's so easy for them they're making a shit down and then comes lunchtime and you go and the, the little shaker of the yellow chicken salt mm, and when they leave it out and i get to put as much chicken salt on as i want yum <laughs> so you're actually excited about it don't hide that Make it part of the experience and advertise that as a big part of the experience. So in your weekly posts leading up to home games on social media, post what you've got coming. Be excited about it, but then take it one step further and humanize it. So at the session last night, I asked about who had the best who had the best uh, menu items on their canteen. And the answer that came up was 
our famous chicken, cheese and avocado sandwich. And apparently it's, it's pretty good. As soon as she said it, I started getting really hungry. <laughs> I'm salivating. But please don't tell anyone at the workshop, but no shit, I stopped and bought a chicken, cheese and avocado sandwich <laughs> from Air Bowl on the way home. Was it any good? Not as good as the one that I would have no, got at the club. Okay. No. Yep. But the, the important thing about that chicken, cheese and avo sandwich is you, you take a photo of a chicken, cheese, avo sandwich. I'm going to scroll past that. But if you tell me the story of the person who invented or who popularized that chicken, cheese and avocado sandwich, and mm-hmm. you have a photo or a video of that person talking about it, then that's going to be much more engaging. So even food can be humanized. It can be personalized and made into a, a, a story to tell on social media that has a human connection. Mm. What I love is when there are a number of clubs in a competition, so clubs that play against each other, and they almost vie for the position of best canteen. So they'll, and, and it's a bit of a, a, you know, off field competition, if you will. Yep. Um, between the clubs, and I think that's great because it, it yeah. it's, it's a story. Sort of comp- it's a story, but it's also the sort of competition that exists in the real world. So mm. you know, it's a, a good news story as well, like you say. But uh, it, it's there's a huge opportunity here, and in terms of the the marketing opportunities that exist for those stories, as you're saying, it's just something that the vast majority of people won't think about because yeah. we're not a canteen organization we're a footy club we're a you know cricket club or whatever so turn that turn that on its head see the biz the canteen as a business unit that it is and then run it like that business once you've got and especially now that we're mid-season so now's exactly the time to be having a critical look at this with registration the busyness of our of our volunteers during the registration part of the season has now passed We're not yet into the busyness of organising finals. So now's a great time to take that strategic step back and not just look at setting targets for our membership next year, not just setting goals for what we, what uh, income, our our break even point for membership. So knowing Mm -hmm. what our membership fees are going to be and how many we then need, but then saying, let's have a critical look at our business units. And if you run a canteen, start there because it's got so much upside. There's so much opportunity in in canteens that is at the moment untapped just have a look at it and then run so now we're into the takeaways pardon the pun run Mm. rather than just saying right we're going to change everything and go and change our menu do roving sales and get set get a new point of sale system in our canteen rather than do it like that and and try and think about it as something that's too big to do because yes the barriers to people getting involved are that it's work and it's different so it moves us away from the status quo so just take one, I was going to say, take one bite. <laughs> At least I'm thinking food, Steve. Yeah, but, yeah. You're dropping great nature. I'm <laughs> take, just burning one, after a take drop of alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> so just take one bite and say, all right, let's just one idea and let's give that a crack and run it as an experiment. So we know the baseline. The baseline is our current financial performance and the number of people standing in line. I would love to see everyone get to the point. I have seen some really successful canteens. So we're kind of hanging shit on clubs in general. And that is certainly not the case. In fact, one of our clubs I know has, <laughs> they've, they've moved, they've now got three point of sale points in their canteen. Each of them has their own uh, card collection system. So that now they've got three lines going up because it started as one and it, the, the line from the canteen started this is a rugby club ran down the stairs in front of the canteen and actually ran onto the field so <laughs> the canteen line was in the it was in the in goal area of the rugby field so that's not okay so then they thought well hang on a minute let's get their money faster so small investment made a massive ongoing a bit of increase in their ability to make more money so just pick one idea and then start one thing and run it as an experiment and see how you go. And then that demonstrates your success. And then that, if you do have some stalwarts and saying, oh, no, we're a cash only club here, then, then you've got some data to be able to go back to them and say, actually, this shit works. And if we make all of this money, it's all pure cream. Us being not for profit means that we can never dip into that money as if we're shareholders taking a dividend. So let's, it gives us the ability to run better programs, have better facilities, better equipment better people if we could then kpis on paid staff you know we've got the ability to really skyrocket growth from just making some tiny little steps on these additional business units and if i'm thinking of the right club 
they implemented a pre-ordering system online did, where you yeah. know when your child's game is going to finish. So you can pre-order your food and drink to pick up yep. 10 minutes later, which again avoids any of those Jeez. three lines. Yep. Yep. Um, Plus you've already got the money. It's, it's a guaranteed the sale. The money's already there. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I've, I've got a, another takeaway and it's, it's indicative of, of a trap that some of those clubs that run a really successful canteen have fallen into in, in my experience. And that is if you make, if you build your canteen up to the point where it's making good money, or you already have a canteen that's making good money, don't drop your fees. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't take that money and, put it towards your operational expenditure to put players on the field or in the pool or on the court. See that money. It's the cream money. It's the cream. Mm. It's, it's not money that should go into seeing out your operational expenditure, but see it for the opportunity that it presents to To grow, to be better. Yeah. Yeah. And to, to achieve, you know, significant or transformational change. If you, if you trade profitably over, you know, consecutive years and you build your consolidated revenue up to the point where you can contribute to a grant funded project or do an expensive project all on your own. That's business. That's yep. good business. Yep. And the final takeaway for me then Steve is the advertising one that don't hide your light, actually let it shine. This is what we've got. Here is our menu. Here is our celebration of what's fantastic. But as you're doing that, do me one more favor and just scroll, scroll through some of your old posts, particularly if, if you haven't been posting a lot, if you're one of these clubs that still has posts from COVID high in your, <laughs> high on your, high in your Facebook feed. And look, if you've got something there saying canteen closed again due to COVID, that's time bound. It's passed. Get rid of it. Canteen closed again due to flooding. Get rid of it. It's passed. Like we don't want those sorts of messages there and they're not helpful replace them with the exciting new messages. Now, all of the stuff that we've talked about, apart from potentially investing in some more point of sale systems and card readers and those sorts of things, which are just not expensive these days, Mm. everything that we've talked about is either ridiculously cheap or completely free. So like I said, just, just let's start somewhere, have a think and then pull the trigger, get into it. Yep. Absolutely. It is a matter of thinking differently, I think, for a lot of clubs. And hopefully this will be the, the rocket under the bums that helps to change some actions. Absolutely. Well. So if you're one of those clubs that then goes and changes a whole heap of actions because you've had a rocket under your bum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness me. Let us know. We would love to know what sort of a difference it can make. So please do give us some feedback. Steve, as usual, it's been lovely talking with you about this stuff. And we did we did get on a bit of a rant, don't we? We had, for our it's listeners, been too long, of, clearly. Obviously, for a little bit of behind the scenes goodies for you all before we actually get the bit that goes to air. We always say, so we, I reckon we've probably got, a, oh, there's probably five minutes. We should be done in about five minutes. I don't know. We've probably been going for 40 minutes <laughs> already because there's stuff to talk about. There's so many exciting, there's so many, and it's all about the exciting opportunity. So yes, thank you, Steve, for another opportunity to talk to you about fun stuff to get our basket Casey clubs into showcase land. Thank you again to Jess, our wonderful producer and editor, who will no doubt be editing a bit of probably some of my crappy dad jokes and the 17 other alcohol references that Steve made that you didn't hear that didn't make them dying on the editing room floor. If you're not already following us on social media, have a look at what's on our menu and what good things we've got coming up. Uh, You can find us on our website, cprgroup.com.au. And of course, we do have a phone number. So if you'd like to give us a ring and talk through any ways that you've been basket cased or turned into (laughs) showcased, we'd love to hear about it. Thanks again, Steve. I look forward to continuing our discussions about marketing opportunities next time. As do I. Thank you. And I look forward to chatting again in a little less than uh, hopefully <laughs> 19 <four> years. Weeks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> six months, four <laughs> days, 12 hours and six seconds. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Uh, see you, see you later.